the peace of Christ be with you, my sisters and brothers, as you shelter in place from your homes this Sunday morning, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. We pray that you are well, and we greet you this day. You are now invited to join with us in our call to worship. God's work is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open yourselves this day to receive the word. We, we have, have committed, committed ourselves, ourselves to follow the light. light. We, we come, come now to be instructed by God's, God's law. Minds set on the flesh are hostile to God. Let us therefore open ourselves to the spirit. Our processional hymn now, praise the Lord, the almighty. celebrate the freedom you give us to make our own responses to all of the possibilities you lay out before us. We are grateful for the revelation you provide through the witness of many in the scriptures. Through their words, help us to discern your word. Come to us in the midst of our diversity to bring understanding and mutual caring. Open us to a new appreciation of our birthright as your children. Beyond all our clamor for the things of this world, we long for the richness of spirit you alone can provide. Feed us here, we pray. Amen. Now hear the word proclaim, proclaimed in song, Jesu, joy of man's desiring. Home and Music Ensemble by Composer. <laughs>
Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan, Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time came to give birth, was all at hand. There were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's foot. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when he bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Esau once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And no, and now rather, our ministry of music, arranged by Jester Harrison. I want Jesus. The Holman Music Ensemble will provide. Following that will be the sermon. What's the condition of your position? By the Reverend Paul A. Hill.
Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ on this uh, sacred July 12, 2020 Sunday morning. We're indeed grateful to have this opportunity to worship together, to pray together, and to serve the living God together, even though from different places and spaces of our existence. This time of the year, traditionally, my wife Allison and I uh, make a excursion to uh, Pasadena to a bookstore that uh, offers a wide variety of calendars so that we can prepare for the coming uh, fall uh, season uh, and the latter part of this year and the beginning of the school year uh, as uh, we live it. However, I want to know um, how did this season of uh, this pandemic, uh, this coronavirus season get on the schedule for this year? I don't remember having picked up a calendar in this past few months uh, that included this new uh, season. And I certainly want to be sure that as I uh, make a decision about a calendar for the year to come, that uh, I be sure to not have a calendar that includes this endless season, at least that's the way it appears to be uh, in the days to come. I've grown weary of the mask that we have to wear. I've grown weary of the distance that life requires us to keep from those that we would seek to be in relationship and communion, communion with. I have grown weary of uh, the, the lines that you have to go to in order to get the bare essentials of life. I've grown weary of um, the needs that are uh, gaining uh, for simply trying to live in this season and beyond. So I want to be sure that I don't have a calendar that includes this pandemic. Otherwise, I have to bow to and uh, adjust to another season of pandemic. Pray that uh, that will not be an adjustment that will not continue in my life uh, in the days to come. I want to know what is the condition of your position as you anticipate today and the week and the months and years to come. What is the condition of your position as you live your life each day in the face of this uh, virus that we look like we were moving towards uh, uh, at least being able to manage it better, if not to come to some closure to its negative influence upon all of our lives? I want to know what it is that you're calling a uh, call to do. Are you more prayerful? and faithful, reflective, and meditative? Are you more compassionate and loving and caring for those that share life with you even when you cannot see their faces or shake their hands? What is the condition of your position as you would seek to be the people of God? Let us pray. Oh God, we are grateful for every season, every circumstance, and every situation that you call us to experience in our daily journeys. We thank you, God, for the yearnings and the learnings that have come to us already and for the certainty that you are seeking to teach us and to free us of some things while you would call us to a closer walk and a better understanding of your will. So, Lord, meet us where we are, but lift us where you call us yet to be and hope, help us, O oh God, to see your handiwork and to be the ones who reflect your presence, your peace, and your power as we would seek to be your disciples in a time such as this. Now let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength, our rock, our redeemer, our greatest friend, and we will be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. For several weeks, we have been reflecting upon God's plan for 
uh, creation, for the continuous creation and the population of the world. We are those who uh, marvel at uh, the wisdom and the knowledge and the miraculous things that God has done in order to make possible this life that we share and we live and those before us. We remember how it was that uh, uh, Sarah and Abraham found great favor with God and how they were faithful in season and out of season, how it was that they sought to do that which brought God glory and honor, and how he promised that if they remained faithful, that they would become the mother and, and father of civilization, and that uh, the numbers of their descendants would be more plentiful than the grains of sand. Remember also how it was that it was a struggle from the very beginning, for it was that, that um, Sarah was not uh, capable of bearing children, and for many, many years they had sought to have God to uh, bless them in this way, but it had not come to pass, and they had grown weary, although they remained uh, steadfast and faithful in their belief. I'm sure there were cheers and jeers and, and folks who questioned their intelligence and their uh, uh, psychological uh, abilities to make good choices uh, because they had grown old uh, even to this day's standards in their living. But nevertheless, it was that they kept covenant with God and as God had promised, God surely delivered as he gave them this son named Isaac. Abraham, a hundred years old. Sarah, I believe it was 90 years old. But that's not important. What's most important is that God kept covenant with them and they kept covenant with him. What a joy it was for them to receive this son named Isaac. And when they were just filled with overwhelming joy and excitement about the life and the gift that God had given to them, God challenges Abraham on the issue of faithfulness. He wanted to know the position of his condition of faithfulness as he received the gift of Isaac. So it is he required that, that Abraham would take Isaac up a mountainside and there to offer him as a sacrifice. One could ask the question, what kind of a, what kind of a joke is this that God is playing on Abraham after all of this toil, all this labor, all this waiting, all of the jeers and the tears that had been their experience, and then he brings to him the joy of his life, and then he requires that he make a sacrifice. Praise be to God for this love that hopes, bears, believes, endures all things and does not end. This love that would call Abraham even to place his son. On the altar. The story goes on to say how it was that God spared uh, uh, Isaiah and allowed him to grow into full stature what it is that he had purposed him to be. And at the age of 40, uh, after having taken a wife uh, named Rebecca, after a strange little interlude at a spring one night, it was that Isaiah recognized that this is a woman of God's choosing for him. For she not only offered him water from the spring in their presence, but also she offered water to his camels. What's love got to do with it? So it is that God would make them husband and wife, and they had the same hopes and dreams for themselves as they asked God to give them a child that would become the source of their continuation as a people, God's servants. But unfortunately, like Sarah, Rebecca found herself to be barren, unable to, 
to bear children. And I want to put a note here. In these past couple of weeks, I've failed to mention this as a part of the story. In that particular time and day, uh, what was most important about a woman was her ability to bear children, to continue the species, to continue God's creation, to nurture, to inspire, and to empower the life of another human being. But because of biblical thought and tradition during that time, if a woman could not bear children, could not bring forth another human being, uh, her husband had the ability to make a very critical and painful decision about their relationship and their future. If she could not bear children, he could divorce her, and even he could put her to death. But because of the love of these men for the women that God had yoked them with, they did not choose that as an option, but they went to God in prayer. They brought to him their sorrow, their pain, their struggles, their confusions, and their doubts. And they knew that if they brought it before God, God would work this thing out, and truly God did work it out for Abraham and for Sarah, for Isaac, and Rebecca. So it was. After they prayed to God for a healing for Rebecca, she became pregnant. Pregnant not with one child, but two children, two rambunctious boys that caused her a lot of discomfort and pain and fear because she could not understand why was this pregnancy such a rough time and rough way to go. And it is that during that time that they both went to God in prayer and sought the help and invite of other religious officials seeking to understand why things were as they were. But the day surely came when these boys were to be born. And uh, as uh, Esau the first was born, he was very red and covered with hair from head to toe not a sight to celebrate and to be excited about, I would imagine, perhaps more of a point of concern. But he was the first, and so he was born with a birthright. He was born with a particular pr privilege and a, a, a particular uh, favor shown towards him. Then his brother Jacob was to come second, holding to the heel of Esau as he was birthed into the world. Now Esau was a man's man. He was great at um, fishing and hunting and scouting. He liked the outdoors. He liked being with his father uh, Isaac. He enjoyed their conversations and the time they spent with each other and how they were able to to catch the kill that would put food on the table, however it was that um, Jacob was more favored and favorable and enjoyed the presence of his mom. And so he stayed in the tent and stayed in the encampments wherever they moved, there's the community. And there, I would imagine, he picked up this skill of making a hot, a very tasty hot soup because he was pulling at the heel of his brother Esau at the time of the birth, the expectation was that at some point, Jacob would be even more the leader than Esau, the firstborn, with the favor that was shown to the firstborn and, and uh, with uh, a jealousy for the relationship that Esau uh, shared with his father, Isaac. But yet it was that they would move and they would share life with each other. And in one of the situations where uh, Isaac and uh, Esau didn't have such a successful time of hunting and fishing and scouting for food for the family, uh, they came in from their excursion, ravishing 
uh, uh, with a ravishing desire for food. And as they came to uh, be present with uh, Rebecca and with Jacob, it was Esau who uh, asked Jacob to give him some of the soup that uh, was filling the place with a delightful aroma and was speaking to his long awaiting and need hunger. Crafty and one to think through things in a unique and difficult way, Jacob decided that he would uh, manipulate his, his older brother Esau, who now was known as Edom. And he said, I will give you some soup if you will give me your birthright. Well, that was the thing that Esau had, along with a close relationship with their father that Jacob did not have, and I guess he was jealous of. But Esau felt like, what good will it do for me to, to uh, have a birthright if, if I'm not going to survive this thing? So it was that Esau made the commitment, gave his birthright to Jacob in order to eat. What is the condition in your life, your relationships, and the position that you are taking in order to survive this pandemic and other circumstances and situations that are inescapable for you today? What is it that life calls you to do in order to, to survive and to be in covenant with other people in our communities? How much do you have to live? How much do you have to sacrifice? How much do you have to give? How much do you have to put your own life online in order to be what God wants you to be? Do you know the fears, the hurts, the harms, the anxieties, the sorrows, the sadness? that have become very prevalent in our world, even beyond Los Angeles, what must we do to get beyond this season, this situation, this circumstance, in order to see and to experience what we consider to be the favor of God? I hope that uh, I don't make a mistake in buying a calendar this year that somehow has a pandemic season as a part of it. But I would hope that God will show us some favor. And more importantly, that we will condition ourselves to be faithful in season and out of season that we will look for what God requires of us to do in order to change our circumstances, change our situations, to change our seasons in order to move closer to what God wants us to be and to do, to have a closer walk with each other, that we may bring glory and honor to our God. We've seen it played out in Black Lives Matter, yes, all lives matter, but there are some of us who have been compromised by others in the human family for selfish ambitions and goals and aspirations, and it didn't matter whether we didn't have anything while others had more than was enough. May it be that we will all position ourselves in such a way that we will discover we've got some work to do in ourselves in order to be right and ready for the new thing, the new season, the new world that is evolving even as we speak. May it be that the sports entertainments that mesmerize and even helps enemies to at least be cordial to each other, to perhaps become friends, even better than that, to see our brothers, our sisters and our brothers 
no matter where they came from, what language they may speak, or what age or what uh, religious or social or sexual identities we may have. We will give praise and adoration and share the birthright that comes with being a disciple of Christ. May it be that God will free us from every hook and line and noose and sinker that we may create so that we may live not in fear, but live in hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ offers us an opportunity to start again, to become new people, to, to thrive and to grow and to anticipate his hearing and responding to our needs, to our concerns, to parlay us from our fears and our doubts and our shortcomings, our sins and our sadness. God offers us an opportunity to be a part of the human family and more importantly, the heavenly family that he seeks to bring forth in this season and the seasons to come. God seeks for us to be reconciled and made new through this covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have not come to know him, you have not received the pardon of your sin, I invite you to simply call upon his name. Say, Lord, I'm ready to give you the keys. Maybe you're one who's been a part of a fellowship and somewhere, sometime ago, you checked out of that relationship. You have abandoned the call of Christian discipleship. You decided to do other things with God's time as opposed to being shaped and molded in his image. You can call that church that you were a member of before this pandemic became a reality and tell them you want to sign up as a new disciple. You want to do a new thing for the kingdom. That you want to walk the walk. You want to talk the talk. You want to live a new life under Christ. You simply need to pick up the phone and make a call. Leave them a message. If nobody answers, they will be glad to respond to your call that it makes a difference when we align ourselves with doing the work of compassion and care and sacrifice and deliverance, when we give of our resources, our time, and our talents in order to bring forth the rule and the reign of Christ, we invite you to do more than sign up to be a member of this fellowship or any fellowship in the community, but we invite you to give of your time, your talents, and your treasures, to give of your gifts, to make investments in a movement that will transform the world. Won't you do that today? As our musical ensemble comes to sing a song of praise and contemplation, we hope that you'll open your hearts and your minds and your lives to a new beginning.
Heal us, O God, with that balm in Gilead, that we may be liberated from our anxieties, our fears, our doubts, our shortcomings, that we may be liberated from our sin, our sadness, and our sorrows. We pray, O God, that you will heal those who struggle in the balance of life. We ask, O God, that you'll be a comfort and keeper to family members and friends who have to live at a distance to those that they need more to be close to in this season of transition. We ask, O God, that you will bless the leaders of this nation and the world, that you call your people everywhere into a more creative and loving and caring, compassionate relationship. We ask, O God, that you'll heal us of our afflictions and our addictions, our shortcomings and our failings so that we may start anew, that we may be all that you want us to, to be and that you will empower us to bring light to darkness and joy to the places of sorrow. Then, Lord, we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We invite you to join in the ministries of this church, first by offering your prayers to the Cole Bryant and family. He has contacted the virus, and so we will remember to pray for this family. Also, we notice in our bulletins today, those of you who received your bulletins at home, the flowers on the altar this morning are in honor and celebration of Trussie and Mary Norris. Their wedding held on July 11 at Holman 56 years ago. We give God thanks for wonderful years of joy, family, and love. We also encourage you to be prepared for voter registration and make sure that you vote this coming fall. In the meantime, we'd like to let you know that on Friday mornings, we have a telephone conference call for intercessory prayer. And you may join us at 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. to share in this intercessory prayer ministry. And so, we invite you to join us in those ministries. And so now, we prepare for our going forth, before the benediction, we will sing together, He Leadeth Me, 128 in your hymnal. Mm -hmm.
may the grace and the power and the peace of God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in each of our hearts. May he grant us purpose, passion, peace, and power for this day and forevermore. The people of God said, Amen. Amen.